Charles Smith never felt that comfortable in his own skin. These insecurities led him to lie constantly and to make up stories about his life. The most notable one being pretending to be a teenager when he was actually in his 20s. Strangely enough, Charles had a certain charisma about him, which allowed him to manipulate and to control people. This thirst for power, mixed with Charles Smith's warped mind, led to the tragic and unfortunate deaths of three young women. What is up, everybody? My name is Napoleon. Today, we're covering the story of Charles Smith and the three young women that he killed. If you do enjoy the video, please hit the like button. Let us know in the comments what stories you want to hear next. And for more true crime videos, please subscribe and hit the bell icon. This is True Crime Planet. Tucson, Arizona, home to beautiful desert landscapes. Today, a growing city, home to more than half a million people. But in the 1960s, it had much more of a small town vibe. However beautiful, Tucson is surrounded by a desert full of hostility. But who would have known that the biggest danger for three young women was an insecure and unstable man desperate for acceptance? Charles Smith was born on July 8, 1942, and was immediately put up for adoption by his mother. Within a couple days, he was adopted by Charles and Catherine Smith. The Smiths were a well-off family who owned the Hillcrest Nursing Home in Tucson, Arizona. The Smiths had no other children, and Charles grew up as an only child. Charles did track down his biological mother in his teenage years, but sadly, she wanted nothing to do with him. Charles was not the most exceptional student academically, but he did lead his high school gymnastics team to a state championship. As gifted as he was athletically, Charles seemed to lose his way a bit and did not rejoin the gymnastics team his senior year. Charles ended up getting into some trouble when he was caught stealing tools from the machine shop at school and was suspended for a few weeks. He was supposed to return after the suspension was over, but Charles never went back to school. After all, why would he go back? You see, being an only child, Charles was given nearly anything he wanted from his parents. Still being only a teen, Charles was given his parents' guest house to live in, which was on their property, but away from their supervision. He was given a red Chevy convertible by his parents, he had a motorcycle, and he was given a monthly allowance of $300, which in today's money is about $2,800. And so with his own house, a car, a motorcycle, and money in his pocket, Charles had nothing to worry about and spent his days and nights partying, driving around in his red Chevy convertible, cruising Speedway Boulevard, a popular street in Tucson. Charles became very well known and went to all the local teen hangouts, which at first was normal. After all, he was a teenager too. But the problem was that this went on year after year, and soon enough, Charles was in his 20s and still hanging out with all the teenagers. A friend would later say that Charles would ride up to the high school in his convertible and all the students would run to greet him like he was freaking Justin Bieber or something. It seems so insane to think of this happening in today's world. Some 23 year old guy pulls up to the local high school in a Tesla and all the students rush to take a selfie and a story with him. But it does seem like Charles did have some sort of weird local celebrity status with the teens in Tucson. Charles would often throw big parties and invite all the local teens, and it seems like this was a big part of what made him so popular. It's not clear whether or not people knew that Charles was a teenager or not, but I feel like people would have had to have known, and either way, he portrayed himself as one. Charles was very insecure about his appearance, and being somewhat on the shorter side, Charles would wear cowboy boots to give himself a couple extra inches, which I guess at the time wasn't that weird because this was Tucson in the 1960s. Tucson started as a post in the days of the Wild West, still having the longest running rodeo, Fiesta de los Vaqueros. So for the time, Charles wearing cowboy boots all the time, I guess it wasn't that weird, but Charles would take it to the next level. He would stuff the inside of the boots with either crushed cans or pieces of newspaper. You see, he wanted that extra, extra height. At the time, Elvis was a huge superstar, so Charles decided to change his appearance to look a bit more like the king. He would slick his hair back, which I guess is pretty normal, 
but on the less normal side, he used a clothespin to stretch his bottom lip, I guess to make himself look more Elvisy. Charles would also use like this thick pancake style clown makeup and he would draw a mole on his cheek. I guess maybe like some kind of like a beauty mark or something like that. And Charles didn't do this just like one day. Charles would do this every single day. Despite all of these crazy behaviors and what we call today major red flags, Charles still managed to attract many young women. Okay, let's jump ahead a few years. Charles is now in his 20s. His friend John Saunders has moved into the house on his parents' property with Charles. Charles begins to date a girl named Mary French. Surprisingly, Mary is 18 and of age. Charles's parents do not really like Mary though, and to try to ease the tension a bit, Charles makes up a story that him and Mary ran off and got married to try to get his parents to accept the relationship a little more. This doesn't really work though. But they couldn't have disliked Mary too much because Charles's parents ended up hiring Mary at their nursing home. It's reported that Mary apparently gave Charles all the money she made from her job. Mary had very few friends, and it seems like Charles exploited that and he had Mary under his complete control. Charles was charismatic, kind of like a miniature Charles Manson. It seems like Charles had some dark tendencies. Several people reported that he had told them he wanted to kill someone just to see how it felt. And for some reason, Charles zeroed in on a young woman named Eileen Rowe. Eileen was a sophomore at Palo Verde High School and she had just recently moved to the Tucson area with her mother a year earlier after her parents' divorce. This move was a big change, but Eileen and her mother were both excited for a new start. Charles Smith, unfortunately, had more sinister plans for Eileen. Charles came up with a plan to lure Eileen out. He asked his girlfriend, Mary French, to invite Eileen out on a double date with Charles, Mary French, and Charles' roommate and best friend at the time, John Saunders. Eileen declined the invitation several times at first, but unfortunately, finally relented when Charles and Mary tracked her down at a friend's house on the afternoon of May 31st, 1964. Eileen said that she would go, but that she would have to wait for her mother to leave for work that evening. You see, Eileen's mother worked overnight shifts at the hospital and usually left for work about 11 p.m. Later that night, Charles, Mary, and Charles' roommate John Saunders drove around Eileen's neighborhood, circling her house and waiting for her mother's car to be gone from the driveway. Once the car was gone, the trio pulled up to Eileen's house, Mary got out of the car, and tapped on Eileen's window. Sadly, Eileen opened the window, hopped out, and got into Charles Smith's red Chevy convertible. It's unclear what Eileen was told the plans were for the night, but for some reason, Eileen went only wearing her bathing suit. The group drove around for a while, but eventually Charles began to head for a wash in the desert, which was a popular place for teens to hang out and drink. Charles parked the car, everyone got out, and began heading into the desert. The details of how things went from a double date to something much darker are not completely clear. At some point, Charles and Mary went back to the car and left John Saunders with Eileen. It's not clear exactly what their plan was, but it seems that John Saunders tried to Eileen. After hearing Eileen scream, Charles and Mary rushed back to the wash where John and Eileen were. Charles then told Eileen to get up and bound her hands behind her back with guitar string. John still could not control Eileen and it seems at this point Charles called her instead. These are clearly some awful people and it makes it so much worse knowing Eileen was only 15 years old. Charles then ordered Eileen to get up again and told her to walk forward deeper into the desert away from them. And so with her back turned, Eileen could not see the horrible plan that these evil men were hatching behind her. Charles then picked up a large jagged rock from the desert floor. He handed it to John. John hesitated for a moment, then silently shook his head no and handed the rock back to Charles. Charles looked at John and then told him to go back to the car. Then, Charles used that rock to kill young Eileen Rowe. John returned a few minutes later when he saw Eileen's bloody, lifeless body laying on the cold ground, and Charles Smith 
standing over her, completely covered in blood, with a crazed, possessed grin on his face. Charles and John then returned to the car where Mary was waiting for them. Charles then recalled to Mary with sheer joy what had happened. The group then returned to the wash where Eileen's body had laid with a shovel. They buried Eileen in a shallow grave along with Charles Smith's bloody t-shirt. Leaving Charles's DNA at the crime scene was not an issue for them, being that it was 1964. The group then got in the car, drove away, and came up with an alibi. The story was that Eileen had agreed to go out with John that night, but when they arrived at Eileen's house, no one answered the door, so Charles took Mary back home, and him and John went back to their house where they lived together. The next morning, Eileen's mother returned from work to find her daughter was gone and immediately called the police to report her missing. At the police station, Eileen's mother began to tell the police anything she could think of that could help find her daughter. Unfortunately, the attitude some police departments have towards missing person reports can sometimes be too relaxed and it doesn't seem like her disappearance was taken too seriously. Charles, Mary, and John were all taken in for questioning, but they stuck to the same story that they had created and were all released. Unaware of the true nature of her daughter's disappearance, Eileen's mother continued to search and pressure the police, contacting the FBI, the state police, the media, anyone who could help, but to no avail. A few days after her disappearance, Eileen's father would have a horrific but telling dream about his daughter. Eileen's father would call her mother in a panic one morning, saying he had a dream that Eileen had been kidnapped and killed in the desert, not knowing how true his dream actually was. But with police refusing a large-scale search of the desert, and unfortunately chalking it up to just another teenager who ran away with her boyfriend, the case went cold. A few months later, Charles and Mary would break up after a fight, and John Saunders would leave Arizona to join the U.S. Navy. This would leave a space open in Charles's house for another blind follower. In early 1965, a man named Richard Richie Bruins would move in as Charles Smith's new roommate. Richie really looked up to Charles for his ability to pick up girls. Apparently, Charles had bragged to Richie about killing Eileen. Richie claims that he didn't really believe him and that he just thought it was another story that Charles had made up. Either way, Richie began to fall for Charles Smith's strange charm. One day, in a true predator fashion, Charles was lurking outside of a public pool. The image of this is just so crazy. Imagine you're at a public pool, and this guy in cowboy boots is just standing outside the fence with a long lip and a fake mole. It's just so creepy. And so unfortunately, Charles would set his sights on a new target, a 16-year-old girl named Gretchen Fritz. Charles became completely obsessed with Gretchen, and while following her home one day, he noticed a very large house that her family lived in. It seems like Gretchen did come from a loving home, but unfortunately, she never felt like she quite fit in with her family. Charles seemed to notice Gretchen's vulnerability and created a plan in order to be able to meet her. His plan was to pretend to be a traveling pots and pants salesman. And so he knocked on the door, arms full of kitchenware, and Gretchen answered. He kept up the ruse for a few minutes, but after talking to Gretchen for a while, he admitted that he was not actually a traveling pots and pants salesman. Unfortunately, Gretchen was not scared off by this, and instead invited Charles in. Even though Gretchen was only 16 and Charles in his 20s, pretty soon the two began to date. The relationship seemed to have been very toxic, including lots of jealousy and even abuse. The two argued often, and Gretchen did not get along with Charles's roommate and best friend, Richie Bruins. Richie asked Charles why he didn't just break up with her, but Charles said that she knew all of his secrets and threatened to go to the police if he left her. Apparently, Charles had also bragged to Gretchen about killing Eileen, and although it's not verified, Charles also claims that he killed a young boy years earlier and buried him in the desert, and that Gretchen had stolen his diary, containing all of his secrets. The relationship continued pretty rocky for a while, but it seems like the two had a big argument over a party that Charles threw when he thought Gretchen was out of town. Gretchen found out about the party and about another woman that Charles was seeing and confronted him about it, 
and threatened to go to the cops and tell her father about all his secrets. After this, Charles became very paranoid, and he made another evil decision. On August 16, 1965, Gretchen and her younger sister, Wendy Fritz, went to see an Elvis movie at the local drive-in theater. They never returned from the movies. Not too many details are known about how exactly these murders happen, but it seems that Charles abducted the two young girls sometime after they left the movie, strangled them both, stuffed their bodies in the trunk of Gretchen's car, and then dumped their bodies in another part of the vast Arizona desert. The next day, the girls were reported missing, and the search began. After a little help from the police, the girl's father hired a private investigator. About a week later, Gretchen's car was found abandoned behind a hotel in Tucson. Muddy and full of gravel with more than 60 extra miles on the odometer, it was only half a mile from Charles Smith's house. The keys, Gretchen's purse, and the ticket stubs from the movie were all still in the car. Police also found a business card belonging to Charles Smith. Charles was taken to the police station in question, but again, he was released. I'm not sure what's going on here, but this just seems like awful police work. And so once again, Charles would go free. A few days later, Charles began to brag to his roommate Richie about how he had killed the sisters. Although the police decided there wasn't enough evidence to hold Charles, the Fritz family still had a strong feeling Charles had something to do with it. The Fritz family allegedly sent two men to Charles's home who claimed to be part of the Mafia. They questioned him about Gretchen and Wendy, but of course he lied and claimed he heard rumors that they had went to San Diego. The two men then suggested that Charles and his roommate Richie go with them to San Diego to look for the girls. The two were taken, but not to San Diego, instead to the home of another man, where he questioned them, but eventually they were taken back to their home unharmed. After telling another friend what had happened, that friend suggested that Charles call the FBI and report it. And in a true genius move, Charles called the FBI. Unfortunately, Charles wasn't able to reach anyone and left the message. So after all that had happened with the two men, Charles is now in a panic and convinces Richie to help him move the bodies of the sisters. Charles took Richie to the spot where he had cruelly dumped the bodies of the Fritz sisters, at which point Richie helped Charles rebury the bodies. I don't know what kind of crazy Charles Manson stuff is going on here, but this mofo is really good at convincing people to do insane stuff for him. Allow what happened in the next few months. Charles was kidnapped again by the few men, who this time did take him to San Diego to search for the girls. Charles would continue with his normal creepy behavior. He was questioned again by police for impersonating a police officer on the beach and trying to pick up young girls. And again... He was let go. During this time, Charles also met another 15-year-old girl, and a month later, the two made the hour-long trip down to Mexico, where they got married. Another major change was that the relationship between Charles and Richie began to sour, as Richie became paranoid that he and his new girlfriend would be next on Charles's list. He honestly may have not been that far from the truth. I could see a scenario where Charles turned on Richie because he knew too much. Richie was so concerned about this that he began sleeping in the desert around his girlfriend's house and hiding the trash cans at the house to keep an eye on things. He also began to feel guilty about his involvement in moving the bodies of the Fritz sisters and tried to forget about it by leaving the state to go live with his grandmother. But after only a few days, he could no longer deal with his guilt and fear and confessed what he knew about the murders to his family members who urged him to call the police, which he did. He called the Tucson Police Department and confessed to what he knew, at which point they flew him back to Tucson and he took them to the desert and led them to the bodies of Gretchen and Wendy Fritz. And finally, on November 10th, 1965, Charles was outside his house when he saw a car pull up. He tried to run inside, but the police stopped him and finally arrested him. He was taken to the police station where he was played Richie Brune's taped confession, but Charles would not admit to anything, and he refused to talk. Charles was booked into jail and forced to take off his signature cowboy boots. From inside, spewed a mess of newspaper and old tin cans. The jig was up. Since Richie had confessed to everything he knew, the police knew Charles was not alone in his first murder of Eileen Rowe. Although they had both left the state, and with John still being in the Navy, 
John Saunders and Mary French were also taken into custody. Officers traveled to both Texas and Connecticut to arrest them. Both John and Mary confessed to their involvement, and both said that Charles was the one that killed Eileen. They were taken out to the area in the desert where the murder had happened to look for Eileen's body. Although they found some personal items, they unfortunately could not find the body. Since they had already both confessed, John Saunders and Mary French were tried first for the murder of Eileen Rowe. John Saunders pled guilty to first-degree murder and received a life sentence eligible for parole after seven years. Mary French received the shortest sentence and was paroled after just four years. It seems like they both got a deal from the prosecutor for a lighter sentence in order to use their testimony at Charles' trial. It does kind of piss me off thinking about the light sentences that these two got. And even more, Charles' second roommate Richie did not get in any trouble for his involvement in moving the bodies. He even wrote a book about it years later. Charles Smith was tried first for the murders of Gretchen and Wendy Fritz in February of 1966. During the trial, prosecutors called more than 30 witnesses to the stand. Apparently dozens of people knew about the murders. Charles had told almost everyone he knew. So after only two hours of deliberation, the jury would decide that Charles Smid would receive the death penalty for the murders of the Fritz sisters. Charles was set to stand trial for the murder of Eileen Rowe the next month in March of 1966, but before the trial started, he took a deal to plead guilty to second-degree murder for all three murders in exchange for a suspension of his death penalty and for a life sentence instead. About a week later, Charles was transported to the state penitentiary in Florence, Arizona. Charles spent nearly a decade there. During this time, he tried several times to escape, succeeding finally in November of 1972, but he was recaptured after just three days. A few years later, after an argument with another prisoner, on March 20th, 1975, Charles was attacked and stabbed over 30 times by that inmate and another inmate, suffering damage to his organs and losing an eye. Charles did not die right away and was taken to the hospital, where he died 10 days later, on March 30th, 1975, alone in agonizing pain. Thank you very much for watching the video today. If you did enjoy it, please hit the like button, and to show us some support, please subscribe and hit the bell icon. This is True Crime Planet.